Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of In the Know with Cat Bobino. I know it's been a short hiatus since I've done a few episodes, but I'm back, and today I have an extra special guest. His name is Aaron Shepard, and he's coming all the way from South Carolina. So welcome to the show, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Oh, no problem. So why don't you tell the audience what your background is in? Um, so my background is I am currently working towards my master's degree in electrical engineering at Clemson University. Um, I've had a passion for space exploration and technology for as long as I can remember. And so I found it necessary to get on a NASA funded research project. In addition to my academic work and my research, I have a dream that is truly out of this world. I actually want to be an astronaut and I just don't want to be a regular astronaut if there's such a thing as that. <laughs> I want to be the first African-American astronaut to walk on the moon or Mars or any other world that is outside of planet Earth. Wow, okay. Yeah. So um, let's <laughs> come back a little and dissect all the things you just said. Um, yeah. So electrical engineering, let's start there. What made yes. you want to do that? What made you want to go into electrical engineering? Um, so I actually, before going to Clemson, I went to a small college in South Carolina and I majored in biochemistry. And I liked science, but there was just something that I was missing. And even though I was good at what I did, I just didn't have the passion for it. So I sat down after a little while and I just really thought about what I wanted to do with my life, what I loved. And I'm that kid, I've always loved to take things apart and put them back together again. Um, I love technology. I, I'm really just tech savvy. I've always been very quick at picking up computers or programming or anything like that. And so that that the, that combination of you know wanting to take things apart but then wanting to also get into the technical side led me to engineering and I knew that I wanted to get into robotics which is you can get into it from a whole bunch of different fields but electrical engineering just seemed like the most balanced way to do it because you're studying the hardware you're studying the software you're studying the how to wire it power it and all that That's um, <laughs> That's cool. Like, I feel like every engineer I've ever met is someone as a child who loved to take things apart and <laughs> their parents probably did not yeah. scold them as much as they should have. Only a few of my engineer people I've interviewed actually got in trouble. Did your parents scold you or were you the one who kind of got away with taking things apart? Um, I've gotten scolded a couple of times only if I left it broken. I got real good at figuring out how to put it back together because I, I didn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That is wonderful. So electrical engineering, you did that in undergrad, right? Oh, uh, no, I did biochemistry in undergrad. Oh, biochemistry. I'm doing electrical, right. biochemistry. I'm doing electrical engineering now. Yes. Mm -hmm. So biochemistry in undergrad and then electrical engineering in grad and this combination of degrees in STEM, like, do you find that it was helpful taking biochemistry uh, first and now engineering? Yes. So actually, um, my, the area that I research, uh, and we're designing these robots, they're based off of snakes and elephant trunks and octopus tentacles and all these other biological structures. And so when I'm designing, because I've had that, um, that life science background, I'm not afraid to look at you know, anatomy or draw things from nature as far as inspiration of how I want to build the robot. So I think that it, it gives me a unique perspective on things instead of, as opposed to someone who just comes from a straight engineering background or uh, computer background, I can actually think, well, what do I see in life and how could I mimic that to achieve a similar goal? Okay. So the lab you're currently in is making, um, what you would say, drones based off life science. So do they have people in biology in that lab as well to kind of counteract it? Or are you that biology aspect, that life science aspect that's kind of telling everyone or showing everyone where to look for um, when we talk about octopus tentacles or elephant trunks? It, it is one of those things where if you go back and look at the very beginning of a lot of the projects, they do, it is kind of, it is heavy in biological research at first. And that's where the basic design comes from. Or, or for example, if you're looking at a tentacle and you're like, oh, well, the octopus has this many muscles to make it move 
its tentacle to the right. Mm-hmm. Let's see if we can um, mimic that in real life. Um, I am still relatively new in the lab, so I'm not that guy yet, but I feel like as time goes on and I get more experience under my belt, I, that bio, that biology background is just going to come in and really help give me an, give me an advantage when designing. Okay. Well, that's really awesome. And so these robotics, this is all NASA funded. So hopefully NASA is going to use these drones on other planets somewhere, hopefully in the future, near future, right? Yes. So um, we we actually get funding from a lot of different places. NASA is one of them, the Department of Defense, um, Mm. the National Science Foundation, yeah, it's a, it, when I was touring the lab and I, I when I met the professor and decided to tour the lab and he was telling me all the places that the funding comes from, I was like, whoa, that's really awesome. Like, I have to be a part of this. Um, actually, we just, it, it was for another project, um, two of the PhD students in, in my lab, they worked on this robot that we took down to Houston and actually got to use on a mock-up of the International Space Station. So we're in NASA using their facilities on the, on the equipment that the astronauts train on, and it, it's, it's such a cool experience. It sounds like a cool experience. I would have loved to do that, just be a fly on the wall and be down in Houston while you doing the uh, drones in the mock-up of the space station. Like, I don't know. I would have been, I just would have had a great time. <laughs> there too watching oh, I, I all did. that stuff <laughs> would you say yeah like yeah i i definitely did i was more of an assistant i i helped to make sure that everything was organized or they would or um the students would be like hey we need a soldering iron so i'd pull one out of our toolbox and get it to them but i just to be in that place and to see so see so much of our nation's space program's history I mean, Mission Control was there. The all the astronauts that have ever trained since the '80s were in the same building that I was in working, mm. and so it made me feel really special. That's really, really awesome. So let's talk about um, your desire to be an astronaut. Where did that come from? Or right? was it this trip mm. in Houston, or was it previous before that? What made you want to be an astronaut? Um, okay, so it's it's really hard to pinpoint the exact origin. I know growing up, ever since I was little, um, I would watch a lot of Star Trek with my great grandma. <laughs> and of course, like I grew up watching Star Wars and I played all the video games and that that was kind of the initial the initial start. But as I got older and I started to mature, my reasons for wanting to be an astronaut matured as well. Um, I noticed that I, I didn't want to just be a person who d- woke up, did a nine to five, and then went home. Like I wanted to work in a career that I was passionate about, a career that would constantly challenge me, and that would constantly call me to solve new problems and innovate and develop new technology. And space exploration is the best way to do it because if you think about it, we we're trying to see places that we've never seen or um, get data that no human being has ever seen before. And so you have to develop all this innovative technology and the the problem solving that comes with it. But I would say the biggest driving force is the the social changes that space exploit space exploration brings us. Um, if you think about it, so when we went up for the first time around in the 60s, mm-hmm. We had this entirely new perspective of who we were. Um, a lot of astronauts report that when they go up and they just see Earth, it changes their mind, literally, because you just see this big, beautiful planet, and there are no borders, no no separation. It doesn't matter your race or your color or your, your nationality, your religion. You're all human, and you're all in that Earth. You're all on that little planet, and then you see how the earth is just floating in this void and you realize that life is so special and that all the little things that we bicker about down here don't really matter as much. So those, those kind of social and philosophical changes that space exploration brings humanity, I think for me as an adult, that's what really pushes me even more. Wow. Yeah, that is, that's 
so true and so amazing. Like I have heard those stories of astronauts going into space and you, you know, you see the photos, you see the video of the earth and how beautiful it is, but it is this one blue marble in this vast amount of open space. And so yes. <laughs> I think that it's very admirable of you that you want to be a part of those who are able to go into space because that's a very small number compared to all the people on the earth. That is a very tiny number of those who actually get the opportunity to go. So I am rooting for you like I'm in your corner. I think that is an awesome dream to do. I don't know if I can stay in a um, ship as long as you'd have to stay to go to the moon or Mars. And Mars, right, is about a mm -hmm. four month journey from Earth. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's between four and seven months, I think. I, I can't remember the numbers, but it's a long time. The moon is only three days, though. <laughs> yeah, I I know, but um, I don't know if you've ever gone camping and you are gone across country in a, a van or in a, you know, one of those things. I've done that. Yeah. And it can get pretty crowded, and you know, <laughs> you get tired of being in that thing. At least though, if you're traveling cross country. You can get out, you can take a pit stop, you can walk around, stretch your legs. Now, three days on a shuttle going to the moon, you know, you're only getting that a small amount of t space to actually move and you have to share it with people. Now, I'm just talking about me. Like, I don't know if <laughs> I can do that. But um, if you can do that, that is awesome. I think that's yes, good. I I, I grew up in a really big family, and so I'm used to being very crammed in with lots of people and no space, so it's all good. Yeah, it is. That is tough. That is tough for me. But um, but the Mars trip. Now, Mars, four to seven months, at this point in our lives, is a one-way trip. So are you okay with that, that one way, staying on Mars, and then being that first human to colonize a new, a new planet? Yes, I am. It's one of those things. It's it's really hard to reconcile because you have so many you have so many things back on Earth and you have so many loved ones. But I think if you are given that opportunity, you should take it. And I, at least if you're in my shoes and you're like, oh well, this is what I really want, then you should take the opportunity the moment that it's given to you. And to to make history like that, uh, I I feel like you're you're leaving behind a lot, but you're setting the path for so much more instead. Um, what is it? There's a line from The Martian where he, where Matt Damon talks about every time I go somewhere and I see something, I'm the first human to see it. Right. And it's just to be in that position to be the first human there. You, you're paving the way for humanity. You you have opened up a new path that will lead to boundless discoveries and benefits and so i think yes that is something that it, it would be hard to reconcile at first but i think ultimately out of a sense of duty for our our species yes that's something i'd be willing to do wow that is <laughs> i don't even know how to explain that type of reasoning because i know it would be very very difficult for me and it's not like you would go alone though because i know it'd be a full crew of people going and robotics as well, drones as well, and you'll have to build yes. your own, um, your your place once you get there. And the only reason I'm even aware of this right now is because uh, I'm on the board for a nonprofit for girls in STEM, and we just took them to NASA Ames out here in California. And so some of the girls got an opportunity <laughs> to learn about the research being done for space exploration to Mars. So um, mm -hmm. that's why I'm versed in it at this present moment, because if you had talked to me two weeks ago, I probably wouldn't even <laughs> know all of this stuff. But I think it's really interesting that, you know, being able to stay on a shuttle for that long, going to a planet and knowing it's, or at this point, it's a one-way trip because we don't have all that fuel to come back. But being able to see, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, guide me through it because I feel like all you're going to see is red dirt. Right, like you're not just gonna see too too much things going on there. It's a it's kind of Yo. a dead planet, right? 
Yeah. You you hope it is dead, because if it's not, you're in for a big surprise. Yes. Yes, as far as we know, as far as um, curiosity has shown us, it's mm. a pretty desolate planet. So, you know, are you sh you're sure that you're fine being basically what would be the equivalent, I think, of being in the desert for the rest of your life? Actually, yes. Um, I have. I've been in the Sahara before, and I love the desert. I've, I've always loved like the colors and the landscapes, and um, riding on the dunes. So I, I, I would make it work. You know, <laughs> have a okay. little bit of fun. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's that is, that is a okay. So, um, so we have gotten to your undergrad. That was biochemistry. Grad school now. Do you feel like you want to continue on to a PhD at this point? And if so what would you be studying then? Um, I, I'm pretty sure I will. I, I told myself, just take your time, work through it, um, and finish your master's and then evaluate then. But if I were to continue towards my PhD, it would be in the same field of the continuum robots, so the tentacle robots, because I, I, really, I really find my work interesting and as the more I do it, the more I have this desire to want to contribute to the field, to become an expert in it. So I, I sound like the, I sound like I'm going to be a PhD. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. <laughs> but, and um, definitely, um, some of my professors are like, "Yeah, when you finish your PhD." <laughs> so right. But it's just it, it's just really caring about something so much that you want to see it develop further is, is, is that's the feeling that I'm starting to get now as, as I'm working towards my master's degree. Okay. And so um, when you did your transitioning from undergrad to master's degree, knowing that it was in biochemistry, did you have um, engineering or computer courses that you took in undergrad? Or was this something you did on your own accord that helped you go and be successful in your master's program? Um, I didn't take too many engineering or computer courses. Like I said, I've naturally been adept with computers, so I, I pick up programming relatively quickly. Uh -huh. um, it was just, I, I sat down and I thought about it, and I said, you know, I, I really have this passion for technology. Why don't I do engineering where my job would be to develop it and push it further? And so I, I kind of have, and I'm still working through the catch up part of the program before I actually get head on into the master's degree. So I'm going back and finishing out the math sequence and um, learning kind of some of the basics of engineering before I take the advanced classes. But it, it, even so, in doing that, like I really love the classes. The coursework's exciting. I, I think it's so cool when I when I have to do like circuit analysis or when I have to go through digital logic gates. It's just really it, it's really exciting to me. So I, I can't wait I, to get into those advanced classes. I, I don't know if I've ever heard someone say how much they enjoy their classes, which is fine. I think that's great because I enjoyed some of my biology classes when I took those classes. But the reason I asked mm -hmm. is because, you know, you never know who is going to be watching the programming. And there could be a student right now that's in the physical sciences who are cons um, has a desire to transfer over to computers or engineering or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I right, like to, yeah. <laughs> you know, open up and say these are the things you'd have to do if you decided you wanted to switch into a different part of the STEM career. So with you, you started with biochemistry, but you are taking makeup classes, the math and the engineering, in order to continue on with the master's, right? Right, yeah. Okay, and but you're enjoying it and you're going to... Work, are you already working on your thesis? So even when you do take those courses, it probably won't take as long as someone who just jumped on in and may not have known what research they wanted to do. So that works out in the long run, I think. And um, does the program you're in now oh, yeah. <laughs> offer the PhD or would you have to go to a different school? Oh no, they offer the PhD. <laughs> I, I think they're, they're really, 
they're not pushing me towards a PhD. They're they're in a couple of hey, well, you should get your PhD or hey, when you finish your PhD. So it's it's the PhD is there, and honestly, I don't think I'd want to go anywhere else because of just the relationships that I've built, um, my kind of attachment to the area, and I just really like where I am and what I do, and uh, I, I I couldn't think of wanting to do anything else, honestly. Okay. So did you go to undergrad there or where did you go for undergrad? Um, I went to Claflin University for undergrad. It is a small historically black college. Um, there were about, I want to say 2000 students, if that. So it was definitely, definitely a good experience. Um, I had a lot of fun and I had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I went to... Stillman College, which is a very tiny HBCU out in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So I know what it's like to go to a smaller HBCU. So there could be a lot of fun going on in those places. A lot of things that we don't have to discuss today. But um, <laughs> when you uh, graduated undergrad, how did you find this program at Clemson? How did you come across this particular lab? Um. I had been working for a little while in the pharmaceutical industry, and I, I really just wasn't happy with where I was. So, I, like I said, I, I did all that soul searching, and I knew, okay, I wanted to get into engineering. I, I didn't know what part of engineering for a long time, and I, I just found myself really drawn to robotics, and because it, it, it's such a diverse field, you you get to do it all. Um, you get to design things, you get to build things, you get to program, you get to do all the theory, you get to be in the shop. It, it, it's crazy. And so I knew I wanted to do robotics and I just basically went through and looked at all the schools that did robotics. And of course, Clemson is a really good engineering school, not just in the state of South Carolina, but it, honestly in the whole country, but especially in the Southeastern region. Mm-hmm. I think like us, Georgia Tech, NC State, we're all really big schools, really good engineering programs. So I knew Clemson was probably the best place to go. And so once I got accepted into Clemson, I just, in the meantime, like I would be at work and I would look through all the labs doing robotics. And that's how I found the professor that I work with now. And I emailed him. I said, hey, can I visit your lab? He said, yeah, sure. He brought me on from a for a tour, he was really nice, really, really welcoming. And when I was when I was in lab, I walked in and I saw like all these tools and robots and everything laying around. I was like, that's where I have to be. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And so um, I take from that, you know, really do your research, send those emails out. You know, I think professors, I tell <laughs> students all the time, professors want to hear from you. They want to know that you're excited about the work that they're doing. So be proactive, find those people, send them a, a message. And like you did, you went and toured the lab. Did you tour any other labs before making this decision or you went in there, saw the robotics, was like, yep, this is it, not going anywhere else? Yeah, I, I, it was pretty much, I walked in, I was like, yep, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> that's and... it. But that's good, you did your research and you wow. knew exactly where you wanted to be. So that's what I think is very important sometimes students going to college, they're unsure, or they're, they can be a little timid, and they're not, they don't want to bother a professor, but it's important, like what you did, which is you found what you really wanted to do, you sent out that message, and you had an opportunity to sit down with that professor, so, right, that worked out for you, now you're very happy, you love your, what you're doing, I can tell by the way you talk about it. Oh, yeah, um, it is, it's really great to actually be where you want to be or be in a place that energizes you. Um, when you, there are times when I would leave lab and I'd be dead tired because I'd been, been in there for hours trying to crank away at something and it didn't work. But when you go home and you're like, oh, I gotta, you just, you, you feel that energy and that passion and that you just have a drive that's, it's almost indescribable. <laughs> that's really good. Cause I mean, I do know people masters and PhD who may, who are unhappy in their lab. And to find someone mm -hmm. who's very happy in their lab and dead tired when they go home, but ready to go back the next day, like that's, 
that's amazing to me because we don't see that very often. I don't know if you've ever know about other people who are in the lab, but it doesn't always work <laughs> to their best acknowledgement. So it's really yeah. cool. But um, so I'm going to switch gears for a second because part of the show is talking about the STEM and then part of the show is talking outside of STEM. So outside of your lab, outside of the robotics and what you do, what else do you do for fun? Okay, so for fun, um, I actually, so it's kind of astronaut related, um, but I started taking scuba classes recently. And so in about three days, I will be a certified scuba diver and I will be able to dive down to, I think 60, no, it's it's either 60 or 80 feet. I can't remember, I have to go back and look at it, but there's that. Um, I am an avid runner. Like I mentioned earlier, I ran cross country and track in high school and an undergrad, and I still try to keep up with that. Um, I play video games, and I mean, if you, you can't tell that I'm a big nerd, then <laughs> I don't know what else I can do. Um, I, I, um, I also, so I do a lot of Latin dancing with my wife. Um, nice. I've been salsa dancing for, geez, eight years now. Jeez, that is a long time. I'm wow. old. <laughs> That's really and, cool. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, go on. Huh? Say, what'd you say? Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I'm, I mentioned the salsa dancing. Um, I still stay true to my take things apart and put them back together roots. So I, I build drones and 3D printers and all these, whatever I just find. And I'm like, oh, I want to build that. And I'll start building from there. So I, I kind of, I do a lot. Um, it's, I'm kind of surprised that I can still be bored because I, <laughs> at any given time, there's always like, there's always something I could do. <laughs> no, yeah, that's really cool. I mean, but I understand there's days. I, I tell people what my life is like. Like my job, I have two jobs and doing the show and doing a segment on another show and all the stuff that I do. And then I'll be like, oh, it's Friday, I'm bored. And people are like, how? How? Like you, <laughs> you don't stop. Yeah. So I get it. But uh, with scuba diving, like do you plan on taking that to um, the Great Barrier Reef or, you know, somewhere off the coast of Thailand and doing some scuba before getting into the astronaut field? Oh, yeah. Um, I actually am trying to see if I will get, if I can get a grant to pay for me to dive because um, they, at Clemson, we have these program, this program called the Creative Inquiry Program where there will be sponsored projects by different departments throughout the school. And one of them is a NASA micro G and XT competition where you're building underwater robotics. And wow. I'm trying to see if they will. Yeah. I'm trying to see if they'll let me, cause you have to test them underwater and I'm trying to slide in like, Hey, I can die. <laughs> at least like they'll, if they'll give me, if that will fund money for me to get the equipment to go dive down with the robot to make sure that it's okay. <laughs> oh, wow. That, that, um, that would be awesome. Like, yeah, yeah, and then to so um, my, oh go on. Oh no, I didn't say anything. Okay, um, yeah, my like um, my professor, he does a lot of work with things that are supposed to be in space, and eventually we're going to have to test them in some kind of microgravity situation. Which the best way to do it is underwater. So I'm trying to go ahead and slide slide that message to my professor like hey when you go test this stuff you're gonna need somebody down with it i can dive yeah that's that's that thinking ahead (laughs) that is awesome yeah Uh, so um we only got a few more minutes so the last thing i like to do is if there's any advice or anything you would tell someone who's younger than you who may have that desire to work in robotics like you're doing or engineering what advice would you give them to move forward and possibly get into the, like the type of career path that you're on? Um, my biggest advice is if you want to speak up, like I, the, a lot of the opportunities that I've gotten in the past, a lot of the funding I've only gotten because I said, Hey, I really want this. And it, and you'd be surprised how many people 
won't speak up because they'll think, oh, well, I don't know, or oh, I'm not qualified enough, or I don't know enough. Just say that you want it and ask, and the worst that you're going to hear back is, no, you can't do it. And to me, it's, it's a no-brainer. I mean, I'd rather ask and have the chance that I get it versus not ask because I'm afraid of being rejected. I completely understand. And that's great advice. Like, that is the worst thing you're going to ever hear is no. So why not ask, right? But um, I want to say thank you, Aaron, for Hi. giving me your time today and being a participant on In the Know with Kat Bobineau. Um, and I want to say to my audience, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for always keeping up with me and keeping up with the show. And if you have any questions for Aaron or for me, please send me an email at catbobino at gmail, and I will forward it on to Aaron. As he said, you never know what you're going to get unless you ask. So if you have those questions or you want to know more, just ask. So thank you again, Aaron, for being on the show. And thank you to my audience, and I'll see you next week.